well, for basically all the problems. Um, and that would be, again, part of the preparation for the exam because problem number six, so I'll talk about problem number six in the practice exam. You have the solutions already. And this is the code for the um, problem number one. Okay, so it's on both pages, both sides. So. <clears throat> okay, so again, office hours, um, Thursday, so extra, Thursday, 9 to 12. in the morning, okay? Um, of course, I'll be here also after class today if you have questions. So exam is on Friday. Um, first part, first part of the class, so 10:50, 12:05 or so. I mean, if you have, we're we're flexible about this. I just want to go over uh, the entire period. But if you need, I don't know, 10 more minutes, we can uh, have that. I want to keep it like like the same format as a practice exam, um, sort of, yeah. So let's talk about this. Um, so I I have the, I mean I have my solutions. Um, has anybody? I mean, have you guys worked it out, more or less? Yeah, the the practice exam. Okay. Um, should we, so we have two things today. I want to talk about the homework problems. Um, pretty much going to be connected to problem number six on this. Okay. So maybe we should start with the problem number six, which is also a homework question for you. Okay. So solution to practice exams. Post it. So that's exercise five. Okay, so the idea that we've we've talked several times about is that solutions to the system AX equals B if it if they exist, right, are minimizers. for the uh, for the uh, minimization problem for the convex minimization problem f of x equals one half a x minus b squared okay with no constraints so basically we said that why is that? I mean, even if this system is not um, has n has different you know number of equations and, and uh, unknowns, right? Why is that? Well, this quantity is always positive or zero, right? And if if x is a solution to a x equals b, then this is going to be zero at that point, right? Okay, so um, is everybody clear on that? That if I have a solution of AX equals B, then minimizing this, of course, will give you the minimum value zero, 
and when is the minimum value zero? When, when AX minus B equals zero. Okay? And if we try to apply the, uh, like a search method for the minimum for this convex function, well, doesn't, uh, not so important it's convex here, but, right, so the steepest descent uh, method says start with some x naught, right? Pretty much, um, I think anything will work here. Then choose a direction. Well, so let's say at iteration k, say xk is the current approximation. Okay, then we're going to find, we're, how, how are we going to go to find uh, the, the next one? Well, first start, uh, choose a direction. along which the function is decreasing. So I should say choose the direction uh, opposite to the gradient. And we computed the gradient at a point x was a transpose ax minus b. So dk is minus a transpose ax k minus b. So it's, it's actually in the solutions. You can just follow that uh, for problem number six. You don't have to write down um, all these steps. Okay. So if you if you are at a given location, you know in which direction to go, and then then choose x k plus one to be. Um, along that line with, of course, T should be positive here, right? Well, I guess I should say um, unless DK is zero. If, I mean, if DK is zero, you're already at a, at a cr critical point, and so you're already at a minimum point, but if it's not zero, then you go in that direction, and you, you do in, in such a manner that with t chosen such that um, the function is minimized. Okay? Now, what I mean, in general, even this step is can be <coughs> involving approximations, right? Because even a function of one variable, we said it's uh, it's uh, difficult to, um, in general, to um, minimize or to find critical points. Okay. What was special in this case, though, is what. And not only that, the function, the, the whole function was convex. Hence, this expression was, you know, convex, right? So there was only we we knew there was only one minimum point, but it turns out that this actually is a, is a quadratic function in T. Okay, so in our problem, f of x k plus t d k is one half length of a x k plus t d k minus b squared. Okay? And this, if you think about it, is, is exactly quadratic in t. So you can, I mean, you can bypass that approximation 
of the minimum by just saying what the minimum is in terms of xk and dk. Okay. And again, the computation relies on, I mean, we're, we're talking about matrices and columns and rows, so it is very important that you don't get to think in terms of components. Okay. Because then everything basically you can you can get lost very easily. Instead, it's easiest if you think about it either in terms of you know matrix multiplication, like we did before, um, or if you know if you know uh, dot products, then it would be the dot product between this number and itself. Okay. So be, let's use a transpose. So let's say we don't we don't know. You know dot products that that well, uh, but we know you know how to transpose a matrix. Well, in this case, it would be just a column, right? This is a column vector, so it would be a row times a column. But before I do that, let me um, kind of isolate the terms that involve t and the terms that don't involve t. Okay, so this term and this term. Okay, there are these two vectors summed up and then the square of the length of the sum. Okay, so what is I mean what is this, the strategy would be to kind of take this transpose times this you know the way it is and then you're going to have four terms, right? You're going to foil that and the first thing that you're going to see is the, is the following. So let me let me just show you if I have z plus w. Let's say I have two vectors, okay, and I take the length square. Then this is z plus w transpose z plus w. So z transposed plus w transposed z plus w. So it's z transpose z plus z transpose w plus w transpose z plus w transpose w. So it's length of z squared plus now take a look at this this is a row times a column and this is the trans this is the transpose of this but since this is a scalar then these two things are equal to each other so it's your choice which one you write but it could be twice z transpose w or it could be twice w transpose z They're the same thing depends on which one's more convenient plus length of w squared. So it's like taking the square of a sum of two numbers, except you have to put the um, you know, transpose where they have to be and, and, all, and length. So, so let's apply this in our example. So I'm going to use axk minus b length squared. Okay? That's the first one. Right? plus twice the product between these two terms, so one with a tr one being transposed, right? Um, in principle, we could, we, could, we could transpose this. I think my choice was to pick AD tra ADK transposed times A x k minus b and t is a scalar so t is not doesn't get transposed or whatsoever and this was twice but I had a half so that's why I don't have a 2 here and finally I have one half t squared a d k squared length squared okay I mean this in this fashion you see exactly the quadratic function in t and you see where the um, minimum is going to be achieved. You have a quadratic expression in T, the minimum is obtained where the derivative with respect to T of is zero. Okay? Now, I mean, I know that in your mind is always like, well, am I supposed to do this the, this way, the, to take the derivative and set it equal to zero, or should I do, do an approximation? 
Okay. Well, of course, in general, why you know you you may not be able to take derivatives. So that's why sometimes you just don't have any a symbolic way in which you can differentiate a function. Okay. Then you need to approximate. Here, though, it's a quadratic expression in t, and as you see, the t that comes out is just an expression in terms of you know x k and d k. So let's just take this derivative here. So I'm going to get zero equals a d k transpose x. This is a coefficient of t plus, and now one half t squared becomes t a d k squared. So it means that t is minus a d k over a d k squared. Okay. So this is the algorithm. I mean, this is the algorithmic way in which you can find that you can solve that minimization problem along the directions. Once you, so now you can realize, I mean, you can program this to have xk, I mean, once you know xk, you find dk, and then you find the t that you need to use, and then finally, xk plus 1 is going to be xk plus t dk, so it's going to be xk minus, you know, this expression. Let me use, let me call this dk, okay? minus a dk transpose right. yep so a question if we saw the practice exam did this on the test uh -huh. would it be sufficient to stop there yeah where we say tk is this xk plus one equals yeah of course plus yeah that? Okay, so we wouldn't actually need to solve the actual estimate. It's sufficient to set up the algorithm. To solve the, to mean to, to, to iteration? Run the iteration? No, no, I mean, I mean, many of you have probably, I mean, have tried to do this or have done this for the first step or first two steps. And then you realize that you'd have to do this at every step of the way. Okay, but... The, quest, the real question is, is, how can you do this algorithmically? So how, can, how can you make, you know, come up with a formula where if you, know, if you are at a, a certain step, to move to the next step? So sort of independent of which step you are at. Even initially, like some of you chose 0, 0, which is probably normal, right? But doing it for 0, 0 is probably easier than if you choose a different one, right? So the, the question is, how do you do it for general? Well, that's how you do it for general, okay? Uh, there's one, there are two little things here that one should pay attention in general. Like, what if that denominator is zero? You know, or can the denominator be zero? Doesn't that mean dk is zero, so you're done? Um, zero? Well, there could be actually vectors that multiply the matrices are zero. Like if the matrix A is a rank less than maximum, um, but of course you can you can rule out that situation because if that's zero, then the function would be sort of the function along that direction would actually be inc would be linear instead of quadratic, right? Go back here. This is the coefficient of t squared. So if this were uh, zero, then you would have you would have the function in that direction to be linear rather than quadratic, and linear going down or up. Well, down it cannot go indefinitely down because then you have you go negative, right? So it goes up. Well, up you can exclude also because then you're going in the direction opposite 
to the gradient and you cannot increase in that direction. It's always decrease. Okay? So that, that sort of says that this expression is, is never zero. Okay? But there is there is one other thing that one need to check is you want t to be positive. Because you want to go in the direction opposite to gradient and not opposite, you know, not in the direction of the gradient. So how do you <coughs> verify it's it's positive? Well, Again, same argument. You have a quadratic expression, right? You're moving from t equals 0. You cannot move increasing, right? You have to go down because the, the opposite the gradient direction, you're going down downhill, right? So that the vertex of that parabola has to be in the positive direction. Okay? So th these things you don't really have to check. Um, what, I, what I did in, in the solutions that I had there is um, I went one step further and I said, well, if I if I take the transpose of this two product, then I can make a transpose times this appear, and that's exactly dk. So that's of course optional, but as you'll see, it'll make the code actually easier. Is to say that um, you know tk is minus dk transpose a transpose axk minus b, just watch tk, right? So tk from there, I just kind of write a dk transpose. Um, and then this this quantity is exactly minus the gradient. That's exactly the gradient. So it's basically the dk transpose dk over a dk square. And now you see what? A vector transpose times itself is the length of the vector squared. So, of course, you can see now that it's actually positive. Again, that's just going to make it a, a little bit easier when you when you um, program that xk plus 1 equals xk plus length of dk squared, length of a dk squared, dk. Okay. All right, so let me um, show you. So, um, yeah, so on the exam, this is actually the only thing you've got to do. I mean, if you, if you have to do a, a, say, steepest descent problem, Of course, because I'm not connected to the internet. So. Okay, now you can, well, of course, you're going to say, well, um, what other type of problems may appear? Okay, except, for instance, this one. Well, the other type of problem that may appear is given in number six in your homework. That's similar to this. Okay, so once you have this algorithm, you can actually solve this. Of course, if you have a computer, uh, you can implement this and um, and approximate the solution as good as you want, um, as as as, as uh, close as you want to get to. So the code that I Attached there, I also posted here, is um, going to do just that. In a second. Um, well, anyway, you have you have the code. If you've never, you know, if you've never programmed in MATLAB, that's, you know, you can just take this code and change. Uh, as you'll see, you just change the matrix A and the matrix and, and the column B, and on the on the top of of this. this is the last page of the solutions. Again, once again, this is this would not be sort of part of the exam, um, but just just to see that this works.
if you go to the handouts and codes, uh, I posted here the steepest descent algorithm for for this exercise. So that's exactly what um, tries to open it with Mathematica. So I'm going to save this. Dot M. Save it in Math in MATLAB. Okay, I'm going to open it here. Okay, so that's the code. And I chose sort of the second example, so 5.2 rather than 5.1, which you had. So it's not a square matrix. So there's a chance that we're, we don't even have a solution, right? It could be overdetermined. So we don't know. Um, when you start, when you run this steepest descent, even if you don't have a solution, you'd get to a minimum, right? And that minimum would be sort of the closest, well, one way of saying that you've solved A x equals B. <coughs> but actually, the numbers, the, the two matrices here that you got gives you a solution for, for x. And uh, meaning that the third equation is sort of um, not necessary, right? So, well, well, one of the one of the three equations is not necessary. One is a linear combination of the others. Um, okay, so again, if you um, this is by by far not the most Kind of optimal code to implement for for that implementation uh, for implementing that uh, that algorithm. But pretty much what it says is I choose a stopping criteria because you have to say when you stop you cannot let. Um, all right. Then I use a transpose in MATLAB is a prime. So I'm choosing the first direction and and the the reason why you choose the first direction is just sort of for a while loop here. So so that you can. Um, process this, um, you can stop based on the criterion that uh, I call D2 to be the length of D squared. Okay. And again, there's, there's better ways to do this, uh, but I just wanted to show. Um, so once you find the gradient in the direction, is this is the length of the gradient squared, right? So the first component of D plus the second component of D, I mean, the first component of squared plus the second component of squared. So while this is actually big, bigger than that epsilon, that's the stopping criterion, what are we going to do? Well, it's just very, so the while loop is just very easy to write. You compute D, well, sort of you compute it again for the first one, but uh, at the end you'll call the initial point the current point. So that's why in the loop you have to compute D. Um, then you compute the length of d squared, and also you compute the length of a times d squared. So that's why you compute a times d there, and then you just compute the length of a times d. And then this is this is it. This is the algorithm, right? It's the current point plus the length of d squared over the length of a d squared times d. Okay, and then I choose to plot so we can see the thing, but um, of course that's not necessary. And then we kind of say that now the new point is the current point, and then we do this loop until we um, we get to the stopping criterion. Okay, and I also count how many times this is this loop is going. Uh, okay, uh, finally just. Out of curiosity, um, we want to see, ha have we gotten close to to our um, kind of true solution? And MATLAB has a very powerful way to solve linear systems. AX equals D is just A backslash B. Okay. Um, but of course, we cannot just always solve it like this. I mean, yeah, we could, but... 
right? So that that just takes takes care of everything. Um, okay, and you can uh, plot the um, the point with a different color. So let, let's just run this. So we start at zero zero, and you see the first time we go all the way here, then we go here, and then we go here, and then we go here, and you know we get within whatever that tolerance uh, we set from the actual solution, right? Yeah, that's one way to... Yeah, the magnitude of D. So the length of D... Well, I should have said epsilon squared, but... So it should be the epsilon squared, if you'd like. So I guess I guess there should be more. Well, and I have also the counter. Say it again. Say it again. Uh. Yeah, I'm sorry. You saying something about the axis? That it's that it's perpendicular. Right. I I know this. Everything I try, those each successive uh, path in each iteration is perpendicular to the previous one. So it's it's like a stair step. And yeah. Just, intuitively, I didn't think. I thought it was going to be some more or less curvy kind of path to the object. I mean, is there a reason why it's perpendicular? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a, a, a quick answer for that. I'm sorry. Um, I generally don't think that's always the case. I think it just has to use with the has to has to. Because what you're doing is you're going, is you're going um, perpendicular to the level set. Okay, you start you start at a point. Gradient is perpendicular to the level set, right? That's always the gradient is perpendicular to, to the gradient vector is perpendicular to the level curves, right? And I don't see any reason why you would necessarily always go. You would stop in that direction at a point where the new um, level curve is tangent to that direction, so that you go perpendicular again. But it may be true in the linear cases or quadratic cases. Okay, so that that's maybe the case. Yeah, I think for a quadratic. Yeah, but you, in general, that's not that's not uh, that's not the case. Uh, if you have a quadratic function, I think that you, you're right. But just th just think about this, like what you said with the hiking thing. Um, to get perpendicular, you'd, it means that you are at x k, right? And that your level curve. So this is the f equals constant, right? And you're going perpendicular to that, right? And then you stop exact. So this is where the xk this is where the optimal is right and somehow what you what you're saying is that the next direction is going to be orthogonal meaning that the level curve will have to be sort of like this dk dk plus 1 and of course you go and the next time you stop you're again at a level curve at that point is orthogonal okay but you know, this level curves can be so kind of twisted and deformed in general that you don't have. Now, in the case of quadratic, it may actually be the case. You could actually take the inner product between dk plus 1 and dk and show that it's 0. Okay. But I haven't done that, so...
But I don't think that's, that's uh, always true if you don't have a quadratic function to minimize. Okay, any questions on the um, on this, um, you know, coding stuff? And of course, it displays, I mean, I, I don't have too much space here, but it says this stops after 13 iterations. Um, this is the error, 10 to negative 4, so that's pretty consistent with, of course, it has two components. <clears throat> You've set epsilon to be uh, 10 to negative 4, I think. Well, 10 to negative 3, but, okay, and so forth. The x and y, of course, this is a format where you only see the two decimals. That's problem number two, not the, not the first one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'd say if you really want to try this out, just conceptually to understand that uh, algorithm, is take this and apply it to the problem in the homework and turn in tomorrow as far as but of course if you have the code you have the algorithm there's it, it has no I mean the problem has no um, bearing but um, let's go to problem number six okay again any questions just Well, let me, let me also say that you can now see how the steepest descent algorithm can actually fail to give you a fast, fast uh, uh, convergence. I mean, I think even in that homework problem, there are, depending on what your tolerance, what, you, what your uh, error to the actual value you want, but it takes a lot, lots of uh, iterations, right? Because it goes zigzag. I mean, perpendicular probably in this case but um, so that's why you see I mean there are other methods like this quasi Newton method which may actually be even though you're not going in the direction of steepest descent at that point but you're probably maybe you're you're eyeing the optimal solution you know fast I mean you're going in that direction a little bit faster um, through this other method so so quasi Newton method maybe faster. Now what's the quasi Newton method, for instance? It says don't take the direction up uh, you know negative gradient, but take this direction at each iteration, right? So what is like if I am to, uh, I can, you know, think about the following question on the exam. Um, apply this method, but not to. So take the same function and minimizing using the quasi-Newton method. I mean, write the algorithms to do that. Then what? What would you have to do? I'm sorry. There's a negative one here. This is the inverse of the Hessian. Okay. So what would be the algorithm? Different decay, but as far as TK is the same one, right? And again, why is it the same? Because you're minimizing the same function, AX minus B length squared with respect to T. No, we're... we're, we're um, this is not true here, right? It's basically the same if I keep the previous form. So that's that's minus a d k transposed a x k minus b. That's the same, right? Now, why isn't it? Why can you go the same route as before? Well, simply because <clears throat> d k transpose. Then a transpose times this is no more is no longer the decays, but decay is 
So DK is what? Is remember the, the Hessian? Is A transpose A. Inverse times the gradient. So that would be what? A transposed AX minus B, right? So if you do this, it would be what? A inverse, A transposed inverse, A transposed AXK minus B, A inverse, well, A transposed inverse times A transposed. We're already, in a, uh, we're already making an assumption here, but if if this transpose inverse times A transpose, this is just one, right? Right? And then what's this? Minus XK plus A inverse B. <laughs> of course, this assumes a is, a, is, a is square. So let me say if A is square matrix, then you can go further than that. Right? Because if A is not a square matrix, then you don't have inverse for A. You may not have an inverse for A. Well, if A is square and <laughs> and A inverse exists. So A is invertible. Right? You can move in this, you can move in this, um, you can continue and kind of conclude that this is what X DK is. Hmm? But just take a look at this. Here, you would actually have to compute the solution of AX equals B. Right. That's why the quasi-Newton method in this case is not practical because it requires that you invert the matrix, right? Yeah. Now, it may actually be practical if A is not invertible or not even square. Then you just have to look at this thing, right, and say, is it practical to invert A transpose A? Well, Maybe or maybe not. But the important thing is A transpose A is, is square matrix. Right? And you may have a simple way, depending on the metrics, to find that inverse. Right? But um, as, as you see also in, the, in that book, and I didn't stress out too much last time, but as you can see there, there are ways to go around even multiple... Um, So this is not <clears throat> practical. It may be, again, if, if you have an easy way to invert A transpose A. But there are these other methods which are called, so instead of a quasi-Newton method, There is so-called, which requires invert, invert, inverting the Hessian, right? And that's again may not be practical. Um, one can use. Um, I mean, there are two of them. DK equals minus, so instead of using the Hessian at that point, to use the following DK gradient of F at XK
where HK is given by there is one that's called Davidon Fletcher Powell algorithm and it's complicated DK DK transposed DK QK it's, it's anyway it's complicated you don't have to memorize it's in the book I'm just gonna copy here so you can so it's it's a it's a sort of approximated the Hessian but he approximated and of course I have to say what QK is is the gradient of G of F at XK minus gradient of F at XK minus 1 no 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 excuse me yep mm -hmm. so notice that every single algorithm that you're trying to devise is so that you don't have to invert anything well, the only operations that are required are production are, are products you know some product of matrices sum of matrices you know uh, nothing that requires inversion of a matrix so turns out turns out turns out that this expression would give you sort of an approximate inverse for the Hessian okay? and that you know will that's how you compute the next uh, direction okay so it's not the steepest descent it's not the quasi newton well it's not the newton's method if you want it's sort of um, another variant of that okay it's very easy to, it's very easy to implement now to justify it it's probably quite difficult that's why these guys got their name um, is it the most efficient not always right depends on the on the situation and there is a second one which again another three names Broyden Gold for Shanna now why do you think this are like distinguished algorithms or ways of, of, of approximating the gradient compared to others most likely because and I don't want to list it here but you can see it in the page 120 because probably the, the convergence can be proven to be faster than um, than the standard ones for a large class of, of solutions uh, of, 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 of minimization problems okay These are all in the class of quasi-Newton, so I guess I should have said that's the Newton's method, but yeah, so and it is the Newton's method if you, you know, you've learned the Newton's method for finding roots of, of functions, right? Well, that would be basically be is the same thing for finding the roots of the derivative. So if you if you remember it from Newton's method, you here it involves the second derivative, but this would mean the first derivative of in one dimension. So it would be the first derivative of the first derivative, and that's what you put in the denominator, and then you that would be the function that you want to minimize f over f prime. That's sort of the direction you go. Okay. So, just just again, keep in mind that for, I mean, if you work hard enough, I mean, you can actually figure out the, this this particular algorithms when f is quadratic. 
because you can figure all those in terms of A and B in the previous the previous step. But you know, we're not going to do that. But instead, let's look at um, homework number five, problem six, because that's uh, in, in, in many ways similar. And that's when I'm going to leave you the pleasure to derive the algorithm. But let's first just um, it basically talks about minimizing again with no constraints um, a sorry one half x transpose a x minus x transpose b. Now, here A is a square matrix, so X is in Rn, so this has to be N by N. If you, if you, if you want to multiply a row, n-dimensional row to the left and an n-dimensional column to the right, then the matrix has to be square, right? And the outcome of this is a number, right? Same here, this is a row. B is a column, so B is a column vector. So this one is a function of one variable. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, it's of several variables, but it's a scalar function, right? So it has one value. So you can talk about minimum of that, right? Now this is called a quadratic function. Q is called quadratic function in x, which is x1, xn. And it's just a little bit different than the norm of ax minus b squared. It's different. It is different, right? But it turns out that um, the Hessian is a, so you can well, first you find the gradient, and you find the gradient to be AX minus B. If you write it as a column, remember the gradient, you can have a choice, write it as a row or as a column. If you write it as a column, then it's, it's exactly AX minus B. So there's no... And of course, if the gradient is this, then the Hessian is this, right? So you really want this to be positive definite. So that's another assumption. For quadratic forms that we're going to talk about here, uh, A is a positive definite metric. So the Hessian is positive definite, so the function is strictly convex. There's only one solution, right? Uh, one one minimum. And that minimum is where the gradient equal to zero, right? Don't you also have to assume that A is symmetric? Yes, thank you, symmetric. To get, yeah, exactly, to get the, uh, I mean, the Hessian would not be equal to A. It would be the symmetric version of A if A were not symmetric. Does anybody know what the symmetric version of, of a matrix is? If A is not symmetric, then A plus A transposed is symmetric. So it'd be the so the um, so the, the the Hessian is always symmetric. So it ha you have to be. It, it, I think it turns out to be a half of that or, or, or this one. You can actually half of that, okay? <clears throat> so then the um, Hessian would, would be that. But the assumptions are, and in the problem, these are the assumptions. A is positive, definite, symmetric, right? So these two things are true. So, 
So, so this basically means that the minimum or the optimal solution for the minimization of Q is the unique solution of AX equals B. Okay? Again, why? We know this is convex, strictly convex. So it has a minimum. At the minimum, the gradient has to be zero, but the gradient is AX minus B. So AX has to be equal to B. So you can see that you can actually solve. So in, in searching solutions of linear syst of systems of linear equ equations like this, AX equals B, you can actually minimize different types of functions. And this is, this is, a, this is another one, right? Different from the num in number five. Okay. All right. So, what is uh, what does it take to do this? Um, <coughs> so, let's say we choose to minimize Q of X using steepest descent. Not 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 the probably the fastest algorithm, but. Then uh, what do we do? At x, of course, we start with x naught, right? But once we come to some x k, then what's the direction you go next? This one, right? And then xk plus 1 is going to be xk plus tdk, you know, t positive, where t minimizes what, what a function? q, not f, of this, right? So you have to Plug this expression into Q and figure out how you can how to differentiate with respect to t. well, figure out the quadratic expression in terms of t. So find the coefficients of t square, of t, and of no t. Right? So I mean plug in is not hard. Everybody can do it. Q x k plus t d k. I'm sorry, this is A minus XK plus TDK transpose times B, right? Okay, so I'll leave you the pleasure to continue and, and figure out, you know, what's the coefficient of T squared, what's the coefficient of T, what's the coefficient of no T. Okay. Then what are you going to do? Find where the minimum occurs, right? Differentiate with respect to t, set it equal to zero, just like before. And figure out what t is in terms of x, k, d, k, a, and b. Once you have that t, you plug it back in into the x, k plus one. And that's the algorithm, okay? And with a little bit of... Um, You know, of, of experience. If you have experience uh, coding, then you can you can modify that code that I gave you for problem five to give uh, to allow you to to approximate problem number six. Okay, nothing by hand. I don't. It's a three by three matrix. So you do want us to go through and finish the coding? No, for the homework, I would just I would just say get the algorithm. Okay. Doing the code is, is optional. Of course, it's always a good idea, is the algorithm correct? Is it going to give me, you know, uh, taking me in the right direction? So, but yeah, you don't, I mean, that's not, uh, so again, 
Turn in tomorrow if you want. Um, just getting the algorithm, okay? I mean, finishing this computation. Uh, finally, let's talk about problem number seven. Due Thursday. <coughs> Well, problem number seven is in, in well, problem number seven reduces to problem number six. So let's say now, so now we don't have a matrix A and a, and a number B. Okay, it just basically says minimize P of X Y, which is x squared plus 2y squared minus 2x minus 8y. Okay? With no constraints. Why? Well, this function is convex. You can check that. You should check that, right? So p is convex on R2. Why? The Hessian of P, you've done it. It's basically <clears throat> when you take two derivatives on x, you're left with two. The mixed derivatives are zero. And two derivatives on y is four, right? This is a Hessian. And it's positive, definite. And is the same at all on all points, right? So it means it's a strictly convex function. So it has a minimum I mean it goes to infinity that's so it has at least a minimum, so it has a, a, a only one minimum uh, as x goes to infinity as x and y go to infinity, this goes to infinity um, <clears throat> The question is not to, to find the minimum, because that's very easy by hand, right, symbolically. You would just take the gradient, you can compute it, and set it equal to zero, and you're going to get the... But the, the point is, how do you... What's an algorithm that starting at a certain point, like zero, zero, you can get towards the minimum? Okay? I mean, what's the gradient? The gradient is 2x minus 2 and 4y minus 8. So you can see that 1 and 2 would is the critical point being the only one. It's a minimum, so it's 1, 1. It's 1, 2. Is that right? When you set the gradient equal to 0. But the question is, how do you get from zero, 0, towards that point with a, in an algorithmic fashion, right? So, it talks about steepest descent again. Yeah. It doesn't matter we started at zero, 0, The question is, how do we, uh, once we are at xk, how do we go to xk plus 1, okay? So, same thing, right? You'll be in direction opposite to the gradient. You have the gradient, right? <clears throat> now I want to use a vector because vector x k to indicate this is x y. Otherwise, it should have been x one and x two. But since they use x and y for the variables. Um, Okay, just put a vector x k. So this is the current state. I mean, the current uh, approximation. We want to find the new approximation, right? So we're going to go 
opposite to the gradient and x k plus one. You see, I mean, there's if you are kind of detaching yourself from the specific problem that you have with the numbers that there are in there, then this is always always the same, right? Where t is is the minimizer for the p at x k plus t d k. So what you're going to do is you're going to have to figure this what this quadratic expression in terms of t is. Okay. Now here's the actual the actual um, place where c tying it with the previous problem is is useful. Okay. So what turns out so it turns out that P can be written as You can write the quadratic expression, any quadratic expression for that matter, um, as a expression that has x transposed uh, square matrix A and x. Where I mean, this is a vector. So this is a vector transposed. This is the vector, okay? And minus this times b, where b is a vector, the column vector. Okay. Why is that? Well, let's just Imagine this is A, B, B, C. So it has to be a uh, symmetric matrix. X and Y minus X, Y, and here I have, ah, B is a vector here, so is it okay? I leave it a little B. Let's call this D. Well, D is used for the other one. Let's call this... Um, B1, B2. Okay? No. Let's call it E and F. Alright? So now let's, let's do this multiplication. So it's going to be 1 half XY, and let's do it. It's AX plus BY, BX plus CY minus EX plus FY. And one more is going to be what? x times this, so it's ax squared plus bxy plus bxy plus 2bxy plus cy squared minus ex minus fy. Okay? So if our p is, <coughs> what was our, our p? x squared plus 2y squared minus 2x minus 8y, then what's a? Well, if you put a half here, then you're going to need to put a 2 here and a 4. It's exactly those coefficients, 2, 4, and off the diagonal is the coefficient of x times y, which in this case is 0. And what's B? What's the uh, EF? 2 and 8. Okay. That's exactly the point. Is it a coincidence that is a Hessian? No. What did we just said uh, previously? If the, func if the function looks like this, then this is a Hessian. If it's symmetric and uh, positive, def well, if it's symmetric. So since we wrote our our quadratic function in this form, where a is two and four, well, and then we know that two and four has to be the Hessian. That's a good observation. 
Um, <clears throat> So you can, you can actually now see what would happen if your quadratic function would have like a minus, some x squared minus y squared. Then the Hessian would not be positive definite, it would not be a convex function, and you could not minimize it. You would get, you would get a, the, the graph of this would be a hyperboloid, right? Whereas, the, what's the graph of this? It's a paraboloid with probably elliptical section, so it would be an elliptical paraboloid, right? And not, I mean, probably center still at the no, not center at the origin, but shifted. Huh? So it's um, not center, but it's with minimum, it's somewhere else than zero. Okay, so the key in problem number seven would then be to write this, so P, and again, X is XY, is to represent it as what is this, right? If that's the case, you have the algorithm from the previous problem. So it's the same algorithm in problem number seven, six, would be exactly the same as here, where A is this and B is that. Okay. So apply the search algorithm in number six above to A and B that appear there, right? That's why I'm saying, in problem number six, so it's, it's, it's worth to actually go through it and just write, you know, in a box, dk, well, dk is already there, and what is xk plus one in terms of xk, and even implement it, like, in, in a code. Um, and, again, notice it doesn't require any symbolic capabilities so you don't so you can just um, do it even remotely you know to be here um, like this is this is done remotely um, okay you just define a and b on, on top um, same stopping criterion right so you don't you don't change anything of course you have to say what d is here so you would change that right uh, I think it's still the length epsilon epsilon squared. It's, I mean, not so important here. Um, you'd have to modify this, and possibly you don't have to m compute a times d if, if whatever sh the algorithm shows. Here you had to multiply a times d because that's what appeared in the algorithm. But in in the new algorithm, you might not have to even do that. Okay. Again, this is optional, but it um, well, I mean, it's, since it's optional, problem number seven is already solved. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd say if you if you feel like like you want to uh, practice on this, just look at number eight. Number eight has a similar. Um, So let me let me replace number seven with number eight to turn it in tomorrow if you do it, because then you just have to write what a is for that and what b is for that, right? And 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 the important thing is come up with an algorithm for for both six and eight. <clears throat> and you turn it in, yeah. you're done. Okay. Yeah, if you're done, you know you're done. Don't, you don't have to. Uh, I mean, if you feel like you you don't. Um, I know many of you have tried by hand to, to, um, and that's that's sort of okay. But you know, you can already have see the frustration that you cannot go to the next step until you do this whole machinery once again. 
every time you do the machinery, and that's not. Um, okay, any questions on these things? Oh, and number one um, in the homework, just to, to, to close this um, discussion about the homework. In problem number one, I have posted, uh, and I gave you copies, but I posted the codes for uh, line search with a fixed step and with the golden ratio. Okay, And that's, again, for problem number one, one. So that's basically solving that problem. Um, if you want to run this really quick before the break, before we take a break, um, save it to your computer and then open it here. Let's see if I have anything. Yeah. Um, I don't want to dock this so we don't. So the. What is the code doing? You know, that's the function, and it's a not a very efficient way to evaluate uh, the function because normally in MATLAB you could you would actually define this in a separate file, and then you would just call that every time you evaluate it. But you know, if you don't have experience with that, that's you just type it in here. Um, what I've done here is I picked my interval, and there is a question: How do you pick the initial interval? with the initial point. Um, well, here I just did a plot. In my opinion, asking a computer to plot a function is the first thing, is giving you the clue of where this interval should be. Okay, And plotting doesn't give you the minimum. So it doesn't, it just gives you a sense of where the minimum is, right? But to get to the minimum, you still need uh, an algorithm to do that with, with any precision you want. So I just plotted, so you saw the plot there. And then I, I do the search here. I start with t, uh, t equals 1, as you, as you do there. You eval and here's just, again, the plot. And you go, are you going? So the, finest, the, fi the fixed step size is basically says you start at the initial point, and you go you know, this many times with a fixed step in a certain direction until you kind of go through a dip and then you go back up, right? So why do you start, I mean, which direction to start, I think is dictated by, well, you could be going either way, check either way. If you go to the left, are you going increasing? If you go to the right, are you going, right? So then you would go in the direction where it's decreasing. Now, if it's in both directions decreasing, that means you are at a maximum and you're going to find a minimum in both directions, right? Of course, this assumes the function, you know, eventually goes to infinity, so you have some, some bounded region that you can look, do the search. And again, if it happens that your function is such that it has like a, a local maximum, that means in either direction you go, you go, you go so then, then you, you would do the search in either direction or in both directions. But in this case, it turns out that it's, if you go in the positive direction, then you go increasing. That's the graph. And the reason why it was chosen like this is you, so you can actually see that it's pretty hard to say where the minimum is because it's pretty level, right? From the graph, I mean, from the graph. So here's the initial st point. And then you go left or right. Well, I chose a big step size okay, initially. And that could actually be catastrophic, right? If I pick the, the step size to be 5 or 4, then I'm already here, right? So I have to pick it small enough so I can go negative in a certain direction. So I picked it to be 1, and that led me to 0. This value, don't tell me why it's not actually centered here. I think is the way I, I don't know. Um, that's kind of weird. Goes off, but um, right, and then it goes one more.
Yeah, it goes one more place and it's still decreasing, right, from this place. So then it goes one more time. And at this point, it goes back, right? And you have to choose your smaller step size, right? If you choose it too small, you're gonna, you may you have the, you run into the uh, danger of having to go lots of steps, right? In fact, I think there's, there's a mistake here with, um, I should have stopped here and go from, from here back. Yeah, but but the reason why okay, the, the reason why like initially I, I coded it with point one, so I started instead of one point one, and then that um, no, you're right, you're right. But if you if you start with a smaller step size, then look what happens. You're actually starting going a lot, lots of times to the left, and then you're right. Once you're at the point, then you kind of kind of back go back. Um, so it's clearly not efficient, right? But in principle, it takes you to the, at least to the right, a, a local minimum, right? And I think the number of times that this was done was 89 in this case. Um, well, what I did is I, um, yeah, this is the epsilon. And what I did is, every time you turn around, you take a tenth of this one, this one. You take a tenth of the step from the previous, from the previous search. Right? You can take it smaller or bigger, it doesn't matter. But anyway, that's the idea. Um, so. Uh, not as the again it's it's not very professionally done because every time the evaluation is done at I mean I, I just type the function at that point okay there's a much more efficient way in MATLAB uh, you would if you'd call this as a separate function give it whatever name you give then you would call that function and only evaluate it okay it just of course, it makes it change the code easier and, and all that. In fact, it makes applying this code to um, other functions as well. So, um, how about I change from one to two? If you if you've done number one. Turn, turn whatever you have, okay? And you've probably done it by hand, unless you've already coded this, right? Um, but take this code and run it with this function. Well, I mean, running means press a button, so that's, again, not. Uh, but I would say change that, that function to just any one you want. Uh, excuse me. And plot it. Okay, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't have to be the number two here. Um, what, what do you have to be careful when you change the function? There is a min, and that your your starting interval is 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 yeah. So make a change. I'll let you do the change. How about that? Take a fourth order. It doesn't matter. Right? Um, I mean, I'd be more interested in number two, which is x to the sixteenth, right? The problem with graphing that is you will see kind of big numbers already, no matter how, I mean, you, ha you really have to be careful how you choose your interval, right? And finally, um, there's golden ratio method, which is, again, you just can, uh, you can just um, download it, open it here, and just to show you on the same I don't think I have a, oh, I should have a plot. Hmm. Yeah, this is the plot. And I don't have a, well, you should actually fill it with a graph. But what you see here is that <coughs> if you choose an initial interval, and I chose it to be kind of 
quite a symmetrical body optimal. So I've kind of I'm mean, I've ran the first the first fixed step. I found approximate optimal minimum, and then I've kind of just for the for the illustration purposes, right? Um, and what you see here is then you'll see actually the first interval is kind of this one, right? Then the next one is to the right, then to the left, and then to the right. The code actually picks whichever value is smaller, like in the in the golden ratio. Uh, the number of iterations is actually a lot smaller. Only 29 for the same for the same uh, error. So that's a better, you know, that 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 normally is a better method. Um, of course, I didn't code the Fibonacci one, and I didn't code the others. I just wanted to show you how these two are compared to each other. But um, so again, for the homework tomorrow, I would say run this with this num with this, you know, I mean, with sl change your function just slightly. Keep it fourth order, or use that sixteenth order one. Okay. And that's that's all. Um, after the break, let's um, talk about this. let's talk about the exam. Um, I was planning to do the conjugate gradient method, um, but I I think I'll leave it for Friday um, after the exam. It's it is a, a much more well. It is a more efficient method of a search method than uh, gradient methods. And um, it's an important method. I mean, lots of, lots of current solvers use this um, for for a lot of practical problems. But um, I don't know. I think you have your mindset on the exam. So let's just talk about the um, practice exam. And you know, any other questions you have? Okay. And whoever wants to go to see the soccer. Game,